Okay, welcome back, guys. Very good. So um, today we will finish up the mathematical review, and uh, if we get the time, we will start to talk about the first uh, initial important concepts in the finite element that is called direct method. Okay, so we will talk. About, we will start uh, uh, in this logical way, following the the flow we discussed uh, in uh, in the previous lectures. So. Mm, we for the logistics, uh, the same. I just have some reminders for you, so that uh, for the homework zero and homework one, you don't need to submit. I put the put the pro, uh, problem sets in the canvas. You can use them to practice. Use those as the opportunity for you to to learn and to find out what knowledge holes you may have in terms of the mathematics. And also for homework number one, it talks about direct method. We will touch upon that very soon. So you use that to uh, check whether you really understand the concepts or not. Those are very basic fundamental concepts, but super, super important, okay? I also posted as a solution for the homework number one, and you can use that to, to uh, back check, to check that uh, whether you did the uh, homework correct or not. We, I will soon post the homework number two, that will be uh, that will be continue uh, the continuation of homework number one and provide some very important uh, questions there and then you can you can work on that and then that one we will put the deadline you will submit the homework number two and then from number two on all the homework you will submit okay so um, and all the homework problems actually are very similar in terms of the style with the questions we will ask during the exam. But they were, the, the exam question will be a little bit simpler, involve less co uh, computations, okay? So once you are, once you are fa get familiar with the homeworks and you can do homeworks independently and precisely, then you will have no problems in the, in the, in the exam, zero problem, okay? So you will be great. Also, I have uh, um, put an exam, example of quiz in the canvas, you can use that to practice. Okay, we will we will uh, have more quiz in the following lectures, and I will give you a heads up. Uh, one week before that, we will have the quiz. Okay, every quiz is about ten to twenty minutes, so several questions, quick questions, and then you you can uh, submit. You can you can finish that and submit. Okay, well if if uh, uh, we will organize the time well because uh, our lecture numbers are limited, so we don't want to spend too much time. To do the quiz, I want to make sure in the class we deliver important, uh, sufficient information um, to you, and then you you guys learn well. Okay, so we will combine with the quiz and the lecture uh, carefully. Okay, and use our time very really judiciously. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. And please let me know <clears throat> if I speak too faster or I speak too slow. Let me know, and I can adjust the speed. Okay, either way is fine. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure all of you learn well. So do let me know your feedback. That will be very, very helpful for you and for all the classmates, class members, okay, for everyone. Yeah. And also I have put the Epicus tutorial uh, uh, made by Dr. Ting Dong. And that those are very nice tutorial. We have five in total, okay? So uh, Dr. Ting Dong uh, spent a lot of uh, great efforts to prepare those uh, videos. And we also uploaded the uh, PowerPoint slides. So right now we have three videos uh, online. Make sure you keep a copy of them. Okay. When we get to the class, that you you can you can watch this video. Then you can open them to be watch. Not now. Now is not a uh, uh, not not at this point. Okay. And then uh, I will delete those video and then put the new video. Okay. Yes. Yes. Emma, I will let you know once we uh, we will get the video replaced. But now uh, it will take a. Uh, I want to give you a few weeks so that you can you can schedule it. Okay, mm, at a, at a early October we will start to replace the video. Okay, so you go ahead to keep the uh, keep the copy of video and the PowerPoint at this point. Yeah, very good question. Very good. Can you hear me, Emma? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Very good. And then September twenty six we will have for in person lecture. Um, by Dr. Philip Ben, he will talk about the uh, talk about the uh, exciting research he has done in the lab, and uh, I will also post uh, the Zoom link. Okay, it's already posted. 
So some of you, if you want to join through the Zoom, that's also fine. But the in-person will be better. So you can have a direct, uh, direct communication with the speakers. That's even better. Okay. So we can and then we can get together. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So that's all the current logistics, and I will keep you posted if anything we have for we have updates and uh, uh, to keep everybody on the same page. Okay. So once logistics are all set, then we are ready to enjoy the the class enjoy the important materials you are going to learn okay very good okay if no question then let's get started for today's material if you have question ask me directly okay so good okay so this we have seen uh in a few times about the uh, about the mechanical communication between the single cells and also i have posted the class survey and many of you actually give me very positive comments very very constructive feedback thank you so much very very helpful so uh, we will use those feedback to improve our class and help everybody okay and if you have new questions new feedback feel free to email me okay here is my email address and also uh, I, I posted this uh, again because uh, this is a super important. And uh, you make sure, take care of yourself well, okay? So currently the, the COVID-19 the, uh, and the, the mutated virus are still propagating. So you make sure, you make sure that you protect yourself well, follow all the safety policies, university announced. Those are very, very important policy. And the university has, uh, has already verified those policies uh, are accurate and that's sufficient. So you make sure follow that uh, that policy, okay? And uh, um, yeah, here here is a link of policy, okay? So go ahead to make, uh, you can you can search it. It's, it's available uh, in the uh, university website. So make sure follow those policies and uh, uh, protect yourself well, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, last time we we learned some very important concept. One of them is actually called the eigenvalue problem eigenvalue problem, okay? So let's very briefly go through it and then we get to the new material today. So eigenvalue problems is that we learn the, we learn the matrix, we learn the vector already, right? So for the matrix, for any given matrix, if it can be multiplied with a vector, with a vector, can you guys see my mouse? Okay. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me change it to the to the laser point. You guys still like a red color, right? Let me know if you want to change color. Yeah, we have other options as well. So we have uh, we 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 have uh, learned matrix times vector equals to another vector. However, in some situation, matrix times vector actually equals to that same vector, same vector x but magnified or shrinked, okay? So that is the, uh, denoted by multiply that vector with a scalar, with a number. This number can be larger than one, means the vector is, uh, is, is elongated, or can be less than one, means that the vector is uh, shortened, okay? So this is a really unique property of the matrix. So for the matrix, you multiply with a vector, and, and this end up with a vector, right? We know this end up with vector, because it's a, uh, the, the, because the, the dimension is x times x times x times one, right? In terms of dimension. Then you end up with a vector. But that vector can be the same as original vector in terms of the direction, okay? That is a very unique property. Now, if for, the, for the, the matrix, if it's two by two matrix, this kind of vector can, there are two this kind of vector in nature, okay? For the three by three matrix, there are three this kind of vector, okay? And then and so on, for four by four, five by five, you, you, you will find it out. So this, is, this, this problem is called an eigenvalue problem. This, this vector is to be determined for this, given, for this given matrix. And this vector is called an eigenvector. And this lambda, this number, is called an eigenvalue. So for every matrix, if it's two by two, it will have a two eigenvalue. 
by eigenvector and have two corresponding eigenvalues. If it's three by three, then they have three pairs of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Eigenvector and eigenvalue are paired with each other, okay? So we discussed about how to solve it. So we move this right-hand side to the left-hand side, and then we reorganize, extract the vector, and then reorganize the matrix component here, right? And then because, the, because of the X cannot be zero, if it's zero, then it's a trivial solution. Every, everything here can be, can be valid. That is not, a, not what we want. So this cannot be zero. So this vector is non-zero. Then the way to calculate the, the unknown lambda here is to have, have the, the determinant of this new matrix equal to zero, okay? And we discussed about this, how to do that. And once we, once we, uh, we aim to calculate the determinant of this new matrix, then we can do the, we can do the mathematical operation. We can expand it to this format. And then this will give us an equation, right? Because the, the determinant of the matrix is a, is a scalar. So it's a, one, a zero dimension, right? So then we get a, a zero dimension one equation. In this equation, lambda is unknown. Other, other components here are known. This constant C1 up to Cn, they are all known. No value, uh, the, the value we know, they are constant. They are coming from this uh, constant value in the matrix A11, A12. There's a combination combined together with one C1 up to Cn, okay? So we have this uh, one equation that a lambda is n, n to power. That means we have a n, row, n number of roads for lambda, right? So this n is actually equal to that. You see that, that, that uh, the row number and the column number of this matrix, right? So you have a n number of a lambda means uh, for this matrix, you have a n number of uh, eigenvalue as well as eigenvector. This is all consistent. So from here, we can calculate lambda and then put it in, put it in. Okay, we can get the corresponding eigenvectors. So we have a, we have a gone through a very nice example together, right? From here, we can make a determinant. Uh, we can calculate the determinant. We can get this equation, get this equation, and then find out their roots, right? Find out their roots. Those roots are eigenvalues. From those roots, we put them back to calculate eigenvectors one by one. Each eigenvalue, we get a, a set of uh, equations and then use the factor, the, the unit vector for the unit vector around the eigenvalues, eigenvectors uh, direction uh, has the magnitude equal to one. And then we can get the direction there, right? So we calculated this. And then for the rest two eigenvalues, we can do the same thing. And then we get the corresponding unit vector around the direction of eigenvector. And then do the same thing for the third value and get the value, right? So in summary, the, for that example, we have uh, three eigenvalues and they have corresponding three unified, uh, um, normalized, usually we call the unit vector normalized, normalized um, vectors, eigenvectors, right? So this is a beautiful. So now we know that it, from that given matrix, we can calculate, we can mathematically calculate the corresponding eigenvectors that if that multiply with the matrix, it will give the same, same um, vector, just a shrink or magnify, okay? For the same direction. So this is actually very really useful, very really useful um, mathematical operations to understand the many mechanical problems. We discussed about this in last class that in, for, the, for the stress and the strength, inside of the body, inside of the solid body, they can actually be expressed in terms of a matrix, three by three matrix, because you have a three surface, independent surface. Each surface has a three independent stress value, X, Y, Z. And then overall three by three is nine. So we have overall nine components in the stress. And the only in the object, in a tube object, in fact, we have six faces but uh, they are all in equilibrium. So we only have three phases uh, independent. So to, to know complete stress uh, properties of a, of a cube, we only need nine components and then that form a matrix. 
In this matrix, we can do the same mathematical operation as we just showed a few minutes ago, that we can root, we can multiply, multiply vectors with it. We can find the eigenvector of this one, of this matrix, and then find that and then multiply it with the matrix, get the same vector, okay? Same vector, more uh, associate with the eigenvalues. And that eigenvalue, what does that mean? That eigenvalue actually is, uh, is the value, is the value on a surface that is a normal stress, it means that stress is perpendicular to that surface. The reason is this matrix, this matrix, stress matrix, if it times with the vector, it will, the vector actually determines that direction. That direction is when you have this cube, you cut it, cut it in, uh, in any direction, you cut it, then you will create a new surface. Right, you cut it. That a new surface has the normal vector. That a normal vector, if you multiply that normal vector here with this uh, matrix, then you will get the, 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 the force. You will get the force applied on that surface. If that force is, an, is, a, is a normal line, it is a perpendicular to that surface, that is normal force. If that force is a parallel to that surface, that is actually shear force, shear force, okay? So by calculating the eigenvectors and then multiply the eigenvectors, eigenvectors to this stress, you actually find a surface that if you cut that, cut that surface, on that surface, you only have a normal, normal force, no shear force, okay? So only normal force, you see the normal force here. No shear force, there's all zero, no shear force means that the surface is under like hydrostatic pressure, no shear, you're like in the water, only the pressure on top of it, no shear, okay? So that's beautiful. And then from this matrix, you actually can find three eigenvectors. You can get a three kind of this surface that all shows the, the hydrostatic pressure. And that three surface actually are perpendicular to each other, okay? Mutually perpendicular. That means you, you, can, you can rotate this, uh, uh, rotate this uh, cube to certain direction, to certain orientation. Then all, all the six faces, all the six faces and the three independent faces, they all experiencing normal stress. They all experiencing pressure, no shear stress, okay? So this happens to any, any, point, any point, okay? So that's a very useful theory, uh, uh, mechanical theory. And from here, from here, you can also find out the maximum shear stress. Maximum shear stress is actually the surface that is, uh, uh, if you rotate this one um, 45 degree, then you will get a maximum shear stress. That maximum shear stress plan is the plan that will fail the material. So if you want to find out the, when, the, when the material is under the loading, how, uh, at which location the material will fail, will break, will have fracture, you can use this, this method to find out the normal stress uh, location and then uh, rotate the 45 degree to find out the maximum shear plan. That is the plan most likely the material fail. okay? So if we have time in the class, um, after we finish the final element discussions, I can show you some very nice theory mechanisms that can, uh, can, can help us to understand the failure mechanism, how the material fail, okay? So from there, yeah, that's all the, for the eigenvalue problems. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. So uh, uh, the, after the eigenvalue problem, we also discussed about uh, uh, other, several, other important, uh, several other important concepts. Firstly, is a quadratic form, called a quadratic form. So what does this mean? This means we have a function, we have a function that is the, that has the uh, uh, unknowns for the unknowns x, x1, x2. But all those unknowns actually will be in quadratic form, either quadratic of itself, like a square of itself, x1 square, or it's uh, multiplied with other unknown in only one time. So x1 times x2, and x1 times x3, but not three times, that it will be cubic, okay? So only quadratic. So here's one example. You see the f here. This is a, 
scalar, right? It's a scalar. Now it has the function, has a form like a11 x1 square plus a22 x2 square and so on, right? Some of them is x1 times x2. They only appear one time, okay? And x1 times x3. So this is called a quadratic form of a, a function, okay? Yeah, of a function. Why this is useful? This always be used when you multiply, when, when you multiply two vectors with a matrix, when you do that, this will be very useful in the future when you calculate some finite element, prob finite element problems, it's very really useful. So if we have a matrix on the left hand side, we multiply it with the transpose of a vector, which is a one times n, right? In terms of dimension. On the right hand side, we times with the same matrix, same vector, but not transposed. So the dimension is the n times one, right? So then multiply together, we can expand it with the equal to this vector times this matrix times this vector. Eventually it will give one by one, a one by one vector. That one by one vector is the consisting of many terms, many terms. This is a A11, like Aij, which is coming from the, from the matrix, the constant from the matrix. And then Xi times Xj, I and J all from one to N. J is all from one to N. Sometimes I and J equal, sometimes they do not equal. But overall, collectively, they are summed together. They are they 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 are represented by this format. This is the beautiful, beautiful um, format. This format, okay. In the physics, if you study the diffusion, if you put an ink into the water, and the ink will ex ink will will diffuse, right? The ink color, a droplet of ink will will become dimmer and dimmer. Size become bigger and bigger, and eventually, uniformly distributed in the water, right? That process is called diffusion. You will have a random process. That, that form, format can also be written in the quadratic form, okay? Very beautiful quadratic form. So, so the, in this case, in this case, <clears throat> um, in this case, the, we, we can write, in this case, we can write any, uh, we, we can derive many interesting properties of matrix. Firstly, firstly, we can we can we can know we can find for any matrix A, any matrix A, in fact, it will have two components for any matrix. It will have a symmetric component and also a asymmetrical format uh, component. We discussed about symmetrical form uh, these two concepts in the previous lecture, right? For a symmetric format. For the for this matrix, the the diagonal components remain remain where they are, but the off diagonal components they are actually equal to each other across the diagonal. For example, a one one equal to uh, for for example a one two equal to a two one, a one n equal to a n one. Right, that is the symmetric matrix. But there is also asymmetric matrix. That is the diagonal components are all zero, but the, the off diagonal components actually is the reverse or inverse of it uh, of each other. A12 equals to minus A21, right? Something like that. These two kinds of components actually always existing in any given matrix, in any given matrix. Okay, here is one example. So can you guys see my see my mouse? See my cursor? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. So if I have a matrix, let, let's just call it a B, okay? B. Kevin, uh, capital B, bold in the bracket, B. This matrix, you see, it can always be written in the format one over two, B plus B transpose, right? You can write this way, plus one over two, B minus B transpose. It can be written in this way, B, because here, B half, here, one over two, B, times plus this one over two, B, still equal to B, and then here, one over two B transpose minus one over two B transpose equal to zero, right? So this is the same thing. But the first format, the first one you see is a one over two B plus B transpose. That means, that means you say B plus B transpose. That means in any component, any point, any point, the value equals to B, that previous value plus the transpose value. 
okay? So let's transpose that. that. That will actually make the final results in any point, it equals to B transpose and B itself in any position, okay? It makes it become a symmetric matrix now. These are symmetric matrix now. The, the diagonal point, that in the diagonal point, they are double. In the any other off diagonal point is actually equal to the transpose plus itself. Okay. And then take a one half, that makes the diagonal go back to the original value, make the other point becomes the, the sum of itself and it's transpose half of it. Okay. So this value, th this resulting matrix is actually called a symmetric matrix. Usually we write a B. S, B, uh, subscript S, B symmetric. Do you guys follow me? Yeah, excellent. For the second half, second half is actually one half B minus BT. So that means around the diagonal for this, uh, the resulting results around the diagonal, the actual di original diagonal minus original diagonal equal to zero now. But in any position, in any off diagonal position, it equals to B value minus its transpose. And another half of the matrix, it equals to, is actually equal to B transpose minus B. So then they are actually opposite to each other. They are inverse of each other. And then take the one half, it will renormalize the, the resulting matrix. This one will give a asymmetric matrix that has the diagonal all equal to zero, but a non-diagonal point is a opposite inverse across the, the diagonal lines, okay? Do you guys follow me? Yeah, okay. This value, this matrix is called an asymmetric matrix, okay? So B can be any matrix, can be A, can be anything. So that means for any matrix, if you want to find is the symmetric components, you do, you, you sum the matrix with its uh, transpose and then take one half. If you want to find its uh, asymmetric components, you minus itself with uh, minus itself by the transpose of itself, okay? And then take one half, that gives the asymmetric part, okay? So then you, you can get both. Now, if you, once you get this, you can calculate, you can, you can multiply it with, uh, with the transpose of a vector and a vector Together, you can do this. You can do you can do this calculation. You will find that if if the because the, this matrix can have two components, symmetric and unsymmetric. You will find that for the unsymmetric part, if you put it in unsymmetric part, that you put it in, you do this multiplication, you get this value, right? They they eventually will equal to zero for the unsymmetric part. The reason is that because a i j has x i x j, i and j if you xi times xj equals to xj times xi, but aij equals to minus aji, right? So when you sum them all of them together, some of them, this uh, even the xi times xj is the same, such as x, x1 times x2 equals to x2 times x1. Even this is the same, but the constant in front of it, aij, that is, uh, that is asymmetric and it introduced the minus value and the overall sum equal to zero, okay? Only, only part, part is uh, this uh, symmetrical part. If you put it in symmetrical value, is the AIJ equals to AIJ. AIJ equal to AJI. That, will, that is non-zero. Only value remaining there is actually the non-zero, non, uh, the symmetrical part, okay? What it means, it means is uh, if we have, uh, if we times xt with b times x, the a b a here, if you input the b a, it equal to zero. If you put b s here, it gives the final results, non-zero results. It gives this one. Okay. Uh, Tira talked about the, do the example together. Sure, sure. Of course, we can do the example together. Yeah. Once we get to the example, let's do it together. Yeah. Very good. Very good question. Okay. So. There are some other very important concepts that uh, we need to understand. One is called a positive definite, positive definite. 
That means if we times the vectors with the matrix in this way, ma vector times ma matrix, and then times the vector, final scalar results is larger than zero, larger or equal to zero for any X, for any vectors, then that means this, this matrix is called a positive definite, positive definite, okay? And they can equal to zero only when the X equal to zero, when the X equal, the, the vector is zero, then this term equal to zero, okay? This means that if I, we have this, uh, this term, yeah, if we have, a, um, yeah, here actually shows one example of the equation set, how we, how we calculate the equation, but we don't need to worry about this now. Most important here, most important thing here is the, the definition of positive definite, okay? Means that if you have a, a matrix, you times it with the vector. At the begin, at, at the right hand, left hand side, you times with the transpose. Right hand side, you times with the vector itself. You always get a scalar value is larger or equal to zero. Then this matrix is called a positive definite. Okay, if the matrix you times it, uh, you 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 do the same operation. It equals to it always a larger or equal to zero. But sometimes sometimes you times with some vector it equal to zero. Even the vector is not zero. The vector is not zero. You still times it equal to zero. Then it means this vector this matrix is called a positive semi definite. It can give can yield a zero value. Okay, so. This is a very important uh, property of the matrix. And uh, for the positive definite matrix, it actually has some very useful, very important properties. And let's go through those properties one by one. Firstly, if a matrix is positive definite, then each column of the matrix is linearly independent. The columns are independent from each other, okay? This actually goes back to the concept, concepts we discussed previously. Well, if we have many, many equations, if the equation, they can, those equations cannot cancel with each other by multiply with some constant, then those equations are actually independent from each other. Here is the same thing. Each column of the matrix is independent, linearly independent. Also means they can, the, those col columns, those columns cannot cancel each other by multiply with the constant and then minus, each, minus or subtract with each other, okay? So you cannot. So then that those columns are independent. And then for the positive or definite matrix, they are actually is invertible. Invertible means uh, they can be inverted. They can, they can be uh, one over this matrix. Their determinant is not zero, okay? And those matrix are not a single, they are not a single, okay? If we put those matrix, uh, uh, multiply those matrix with those uh, unknown values, they form the equation set here. Those equation will give equation set will give a unique solution set for any unknown. They will have a unique solution. They will not be a multiple value, only unique. Okay, and for this positive definite matrix, their eigenvalues are always positive, and the real value they are not imaginary value. They are always real values. Okay, and for the positive semi definite semi definite, all the eigenvalues are non-negative. The eigenvalue can be positive and also can be zero, can be zero, okay? So, but they are not negative. So that's the important properties of a positive definite matrix and a positive semi-definite matrix, okay? The final important concepts in the mathematical review is uh, called the maxima and the minima of the function. Do you guys uh, follow me? Yeah, excellent, excellent. Very good, very good. So for the, for the maximum and the minimum of the function, <clears throat> remember previously in, the, in, your, uh, in your calculus class, you have learned how to calculate the maximum and the minimum by taking the derivative. You learned that previously, right? Now here, we will use the similar concepts. Now, for, we, know, we know for any singular variable, singular variable function like fx, f is a function, x is a variable, right? x is a variable, it can change. If we want to know the, the value of this uh, function when x increase a little bit or decrease a little bit, okay? 
you want to know the, the value, then that, uh, that value actually equal to a function f uh, of variable x times delta x. Here you see x with the underscore, right? Underscore. That actually means this is a, a value that we sit in there. We, we use that value, like a constant value. We sit in there at any given x. We want to study the property of this function around that x. So then we put an x uh, underscored. Okay. So when this uh, x, when, when we uh, look, uh, look around this x, so when the x underscore plus delta x, very small value, then we want to know what's the function, what's the value of that function f now? How it changes? What do we do? Usually is uh, we use the Taylor series expansion, Taylor series expansion, right? So we will have uh, original f x underscore plus partial f partial x. That is the derivative, okay? And then we take the derivative at x equals to x, uh, x um, underscore, right? And then times that x. Let me draw something here. Good, good, good. So if we have a function, can you see, can I see my drawing? Yes, excellent. So if we have something here, we are interested in a point here, in a point here. We want to know this point is X underscore. We want to know, the, and, and this one, the corresponding F is this value. This is F value, okay? This is the F, X underscore. We want to know this value here, here, this value. That's X underscore, underscore plus delta X. We want to know, to know at this point, what's the F here? What's the F here? Which is corresponding to some, some place here. What's the F here? The way to know it is uh, we, this value equals to, you, you draw a, a slope here. You can calculate, you can calculate this change equals to this change, this value equals to partial F partial x, which gives you a slope, okay? At the point of x underscore. And then this derivative will give you the tending theta, right? Is a tangent, tang tangential, um, tending uh, uh, slope of the tending theta. That times the x component, x component, which is delta x, right? That gives the value of uh, this uh, vertical direction. However, this black curve is not a perfectly linear. It, ha it, it, it has a curve there. Then the, the, by doing just a linear extension is not sufficient. It's not precise enough. It approaches the real value, but not a precise. So then we need also to have a second order, third order to fit it. And then you need to get the second order. So based on the Tyler expansion, second order is one over half, second derivative of F with respect to X, okay? Second derivative of F with respect to X at the point X equal to underscore, underscore, times delta X square, this term, give a second order fitting, okay? There are also third order, fourth order fitting. Some of them actually will become not necessary because with, the, with the several, uh, several turns added, your results, results is already very, very close to f, f as the variable x underscore plus delta x, very, very close. So that's sufficient, okay? So this is Taylor expansion. This tells us how to find out, how to find out the, the value that is uh, close to the, to the, uh, the point that we are studying, okay? So that tells us if we, we, we can use this way, we can use this way to find out the extreme value, means the, the minimal value or maximum value, okay? So 
if if in the in the calculus class you already learned that if we can have a, a function that at one point if you take first order derivative and that derivative equal to zero that means the slope equals zero for example here the slope equal to zero right here at this this point slope equal to zero and at this point this one slope equal to zero right k equal to zero this this is zero now if you can you, you look at a, a equation a function if you get to a point you take the derivative if the derivative happens to be zero that means at that point at that point the the f value is the minimum or f value is the maximum that tells us this but then how can we differentiate it is maximum or minimum is which case it is then you actually will use this equation use this uh, important use this very important uh, Taylor expansion because Taylor expansion tells us if you look at one point if you look at one point you can find out the neighboring point what's the value there you can find that point if if this one is sitting at the minimum is sitting at this point can you guys see my drawing on the screen can you guys see my drawing yes yes okay very good yeah follow me and if you find something i spent expand explaining uh, too fast let me know i can slow down okay if it's too slow i can also speed up okay just let me know now if i have a, have a function that at this point this x this x on the spot at this point if at this point it equals to zero okay uh, not not zero this has one value this has one value x f x on the square but but i find the slope first order slope equal to zero then that means if i ex tell expand this function this term is this is is vanished this term is vanished okay even delta x is not zero okay even delta x is not zero but this term is vanished because they multiply with each other now if i look at the second second term second term this term if i find this term is larger than zero this term is larger than zero that means around this x underscore if i go left hand side go left i walk towards left with distance delta x with distance delta x the f i get here the f i get here the f value actually is positive and added to previous f x underscore and make this f final f value increase okay you go you increase that value means you are actually step out step away the value the 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 value okay step about the bottom of the value you are going up that means the event the 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 value that has a zero slope indicating the minimum value the minimum value of this function f okay <coughs> on the other hand oppositely if you find if you find the value here if you go at delta x here you go to delta x you find this is the second term second term second order term gives the mean gives the negative value then you are actually go away from the peak you go away and it makes this uh, f value to be smaller okay so that means you are the at the x underscore you are actually at the maximum value okay so eventually how it what it determines is uh, you look at the sign of this value look at the sign of a uh, second order derivative because the delta x square is always larger than zero you only look at the 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 second order term if you find that this term is larger than zero then it will give you it will tell you the value here is minimal if this term is smaller than zero then it tells you you're already in a peak okay it's a maximum value here okay so this is the the very useful way to help people to find a maximal and a minimal value of uh, of the function here the function we use is only one variable single variable x right but in the finite element you actually can also study multi multi variables 
okay, the variables can be represented by the vectors. So then you have multiple vectors. For example, here, if our variable is a vector, is a vector, then the vector can times delta vector, okay? In the same way, we can expand it using a Taylor series expansion. Now, X bar, so here, remember, this is a bold, so that it means a vector, original vector. We want to study the change of F with respect to this vector, okay? So now, this is the original value, and then it will times the initial, the, the, the initial first order derivative. Now here is you actually take the derivative of f with respect to any component of this vector, xi, any scalar components, and then times delta xi. Means delta xi means the, the vector, any component of the vector um, increase a little bit with delta xi, okay? And then, oh, so this will have the summation of many, uh, many scalar values here, yeah, right? Many scalar values, they're all with respect to the, the vectors, the components. Second derivative term actually equals to uh, multi, uh, two, multi, two sum together, two summary together, okay? One is, uh, they, they are actually the second derivative of this F with respect to the component Xi times component Xj, and then multiply with the net change of Xi and the net change of Xj, okay? So this is a summation of two together. X and I are independent uh, notations. Here, this term, when we write it in, the, in this uh, uh, scalar format, they actually is a, uh, a, a summary of many, many terms. But if you organize that, it can also organize into the matrix. It actually calls, uh, called a casing matrix. You can write it, uh, you can, I and J denotes where are the matrix. So let me draw it here. So the, this matrix can be written in this way. I and J position. Any position I and J, the value equals to this value. Equal to this value. Any of them, any of them, yeah. okay? If I, if in the position one one, actually it's a partial square F, divided by x partial x1, partial x1. If it's in a one, two position, it's partial x1, partial x2, okay? And you can, here you can also see it's actually a symmetric matrix because in the, in the two, one position, you actually partial x2, partial x1, they are equal to each other. They multiply, they are exchangeable, right? So this Hessian matrix actually a symmetric matrix. In order, for this kind of uh, function to be in the max uh, extreme condition, then we need to have a partial f, partial x1 equal to zero. Partial f, partial x2 also equal to zero, okay? All of that equal to zero. Then this guy, this guy here, this one, is in the, in the, in the extreme condition. And then, and, then send, and then to determine which this extreme condition is the maximal or minimal, we will look at the, this Hessian matrix, this matrix. If this matrix is a positive definite, then it's actually minimum value. So very similar, very similar to the one we, we showed in the previous slides, that uh, if, if this is a partial, uh, partial uh, second derivative term larger than zero, then we are in a minimum. Here, if you, talk, you, you look at the, the vector here, they can be organized into the Hessian matrix. If this Hessian matrix is positive definite, then we are actually in the minimum. If this term is negative definite, okay, then we are actually in the maximum. Negative means they, they, they are, they are they, they, when they multiply with the vectors, the value always be less than zero, less than zero, okay? This is a very important uh, concept. And using these concepts, uh, and using those format of uh, equations, we can actually calculate uh, calculate the the energy calculate the energy in the in the in the function. Okay, here I write two two different uh, equation here. You don't need to understand now, but they will be 
frequently used in the future finite element classes, especially in the static condition. We will use them to, to, um, to calculate the, the matrix, okay? Very good. We stop here, it's the 141 now. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Very good. Dr. Tang, Dr. Tang, Harry, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you go back to page 19 of the slides?